Welcome to this Grattan Institute Speed Briefing. I'm Kate Griffiths, Deputy Director of Grattan's Budgets and Government Program, and I'm one of the authors of the new Grattan report we are discussing today called New Politics, Preventing Pork Barrelling. I'm joined by my co-author, Annika Stobart, who will share some highlights from the report with you in a moment. We both come to you today from Wurundjeri lands. We acknowledge and celebrate the First Nations people on whose traditional lands we all meet and work and whose cultures are among the oldest in human history. The report we published yesterday shows that federal and state governments on both sides of politics engage in pork barreling. I actually don't think that would surprise many of you. The practice is pretty widely acknowledged even by politicians themselves, but it is not widely accepted. 77% of Australians believe politicians should resign if they engage in pork barreling. And that's actually more than the 72% who believe politicians should resign if they're under investigation for corruption. So we know pork barreling happens, it is not in the public interest, and the public don't like it. We at Grattan wanted to contribute to the debate with some practical solutions. I'll hand over to Annika to share the highlights of the report and walk you through our recommendations to prevent pork barreling. And then we'll have five minutes for questions at the end. So please use the Q&A function to ask your questions as we go. Thanks, Kate. So before we get stuck into it, what is pork barrelling? Pork barrelling is the use of public resources to target certain voters for partisan purposes. So, for example, government spending in marginal electorates to try to win more votes. Think sports rorts. And the focus of our report was uh, on grant programs in particular. So using grants to buy votes is one of the most visible forms of pork barrelling. Grants processes often allow substantial ministerial discretion with little transparency. So we looked at discretionary grant programs at the federal and state level and saw a similar trend where governments give more money to government held seats on average than opposition held seats. And you can see that trend clearly here uh, on both uh, levels of government, but also across uh, both sides of politics. We also found that marginal seats often receive more. So of the top uh, 10 electorates that received the most discretionary funding uh, uh, from after the 2019 election, uh, seven of those were marginal seats and most of those marginal seats were government held marginal seats. And uh, to contrast it, only about a third of uh, seats are marginal in Australia. We also looked at, at grant programs in particular and saw that some programs are more prone to politicisation than others. Uh, so the ones that don't look politicised tend to have better processes with clearer guardrails around discretion. So, for example, with the federal grant programs here, uh, the community development grants at the top had four times uh, more money going to government held seats than opposition seats on average. And so this program was a closed and non-competitive program, which means the process was run behind closed doors and applications were by invite only. And ministers actually wrote to organisations confirming funding even before the department had assessed applications. And, you know, we're talking big bucks here. This is a billion dollar program. And at the state level as well, uh, the Stronger Communities Fund in New South Wales, which was a $250 million grant program, it's even worse, six times uh, more money went to government held seats than opposition uh, seats. And then in this case, the New South Wales Auditor General found that ministers' selections lacked integrity and that ministers provided no basis for their decisions. We also looked at the timing of grant approvals. Um, you can see here there's two grant programs, the Building Better Regions Fund and Regional Growth Fund. And uh, you can see that it's a bit auspicious, the timing of these grant approvals just before um, for, uh, elections. So on the top there, the Super Saturday by-elections, which were the by-elections around the dual citizenship crisis, a whole series of grant approvals made just before that. 
and the same goes for the federal election in 2019, uh, with not many projects approved outside those periods during that period. Uh, grants programs are also rarely open and competitive. You can see here in 2021, 13% of grant programs were uh, open and competitive. Uh, and in contrast, 33 were closed and non-competitive. Uh, so grant program design matters. So for example, the Safer Communities program that we looked at, um, the first round was closed and non-competitive uh, when most funding went to government or marginal electorates, but then subsequent funding rounds were open and competitive, ultimately leading to a more equal distribution of funding across um, opposition and government seats. So now jumping into the recommendations, as you can see here on the left hand side in red is what the minister we recommend the minister's responsibilities should be. So they can and they have the discretion to uh, define the purpose of a grant program, the funding available, uh, and also establishing the selection criteria. And they can be targeted about, about this depending on what type of uh, what they're trying to achieve with this establishment of this grant program. Uh, and then we re require that all grant programs should be open and competitive. Uh, we need to ensure that anyone has the opportunity to apply uh, to a grant program and that these uh, applications should be vetted against each other to make sure that we're getting the most meritorious applications through to make sure taxpayer money ultimately is um, being used. We're getting bang for buck, essentially, uh, through these grant programs. Uh, and then the department, it's an administrative function for them to go through the applications they receive, assess them against the selection criteria, and then come up with uh, the recipients that should receive funding. Particularly, we recommend that ministers should not be doing this uh, process of actually selecting the recipients that win the money. Um, this is, should be done by the departments. Uh, but of course, uh, if the minister doesn't uh, like the final selection because it's not actually achieving what they set out the, the program to be, they can, of course, go back and change the selection criteria, republish that, make that transparent, and, and the process would have to uh, be begin again. Any deviations to this process should be reported to Parliament by the Finance Minister, and we establish there should be, uh, recommend there should be stronger oversight through a multi-party standing parliamentary committee to review any exceptions to the process. Uh, we also need auditor generals to be to receive more funding uh, because their funding is decreasing as a share of um, public uh, spending. So we need uh, stronger accountability through auditor general offices as well. So I'll finish off there and maybe we can jump to questions, Kate. Thank you, Annika. <clears throat> what a whirlwind tour. There's lots to unpack there. And yes, we'd love to have your questions. Uh, please drop them in the Q&A function. I can see a few coming in already. Um, we also had some pre-submitted questions. So I might kick off with uh, one of those. We have, we, we know that taxpayer money is supposed to be spent for public benefit, uh, not for the benefit of politicians or political parties, but what's, the actual harm in Port Barrowley, like at the end of the day? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And we see there are actually quite a few harms of, of Port Barrowley. So firstly, something I, I, I suggested in the presentation is that it's a waste of taxpayer money. Uh, Port Barrowley, by definition, means that uh, public money is not go going where it will serve the most public benefit. Uh, it means less money for valuable projects, uh, for health and education. And as I said, you know, we're talking big bucks here. So as I said, some of the programs are worth a billion dollars. Another harm I think is that it creates an uneven playing field in elections. So between incumbent governments who hold the purse strings and oppositions, as well as between you know, major parties who have the potential to form government and minor parties and independents who don't. Um, and therefore it risks entrenching power and potentially skewing elections. And the third one I'll point out as well is that it promotes a corrupt culture, which in turn chips away at our democracy and undermines trust in government. It, 
decisions to use public money for political gain contribute to this, you know, whatever it takes culture that undermines the ethical norms in government and marginalises members who want to do the right thing. So I might jump into a technical question uh, in the Q&A, just one for um, you, Annika, does this analysis take into account situation of states such as Victoria holding a majority share of electorates? Uh, so we looked at grant programs uh, in Victoria, particularly the, um, the heritage grants, and then the analysis that we did was looking at uh, funding per electorate on average. So that takes account of the fact of whether or not uh, how many seats uh, a party holds. If it's done on a per average um, basis, then that's, that's how you kind of account for that. Yeah, so all the, the overall numbers in terms of funding are per government seat versus per opposition seat. Yeah. Uh, so another one for you. I think this one's really getting at that sort of where does the ministerial accountability boundaries fall, but uh, what if a minister decides the department's management of a grant program was at fault? So not the criteria, but the, the actual overall management of the program. What power do they have? So ministers uh, ultimately have uh, accountability for the grant program. So uh, they uh, you know, can decide whether or not to approve the, the projects that the department puts forward. Um, so, you know, they can, um, you know, as I said, change the selection criteria and get the process, um, get the department to go through the applications again against the new selection criteria, but also um, the, the, the extra accountability or oversight that we're recommending with this multi-party standing parliamentary committee, they should also be able to uh, interrogate not just ministers, but also public officials uh, and look at if there are exceptions to the, to the process that uh, they can actually question those public officials about that. Um, and that's in addition to other accountability mechanisms that we have already in place for public service. So public servants you know, have a, a strict code of conduct already and they do have parliamentary oversight of what they do through, say, you know, Senate estimates uh, where they also need to justify uh, the decisions and processes that they undertake. We had a few pre-submitted questions about the role of a new Federal Integrity Commission here because uh, in many ways I think in the public eye, the Integrity Commission is, is the big thing on the agenda and is supposed to solve everything. Uh, but how does the Integrity Commission, uh, when it's established later this year as promised, how does that interact with the sorts of processes and oversight mechanisms uh, recommended in this report? Thanks, Kate. So we think a, a strong and well-resourced integrity commission is the, the last line of defence against pork barrelling. So what we're recommending in our report are actually stronger processes up the line and, and better oversight and um, guardrails around discretion, uh, which should, um, you know, prevent uh, pork barrelling and, you know, reduce the, at least the opportunity and the incentive for, for governments to engage in pork barrelling. Uh, but if pork barrelling does continue, an Integrity Commission, you know, could investigate um, and may make a finding of corrupt conduct. So we, um, there was a recent report uh, done by the New South Wales Integrity Commission uh, that said that pork barrelling can, under certain circumstances, involve serious breaches of public trust and conduct that amounts to corrupt conduct. Um, so uh, there, there might be that opportunity there as an as a but particularly as a disincentive against uh, pork barreling in, in the first place. We are coming close to time, so I might quickly try to answer a couple more of the questions here. There are some exceptions where open competitive grants might not be appropriate, and we think uh, emergency grants might be a particular example of that. Uh, and under those circumstances, we'd hope the parliamentary committee could interrogate uh, the processes and the decision making around why it didn't go open and competitive. Uh, and in terms of <clears throat> um, rules around uh, timing of grants, we thought better not to restrict that because there's all sorts of reasons why grants might need to go out at particular points in time, but that a better process and better oversight might help to scrutinise particularly those sorts of grants uh, because certainly Annika showed a pretty powerful chart on that one. We might have to leave it there, I'm afraid. This report is the second in Grattan's New Politics series 
The series is looking at three key areas of public policy where political interests sometimes trump the public interest. The first report in the series was on jobs for mates and what a better process for public appointments would look like. The third and final report in the series will be on preventing misuse of taxpayer funded advertising for political messages. So please look out for that one in October. All our work is freely available on our website, grattan.edu.au, if you'd like to read more. And if you would like to donate to support future Grattan reports, you can do that on our website too. In the spirit of this speed briefing, I will leave it there and let you get back to your day. Thank you so much for joining us.